you guys hear me in the back? Okay, we're both really excited to be here today and um, talk to you about how climate change is impacting emergency management, talk about current events, and what we at the state are doing to plan for, prepare, and then respond to um, emergencies that are impacted by climate change. Hurricane Harvey hit, hit Texas at 3 a.m. on August 26th. It was a Category 4 when it hit. Um, winds were up to 130 miles an hour. It's now hit three different times, so it goes back out to sea, gathers fuel, gets stronger, and comes back in. We've seen uh, many images of uh, Houston being flooded. It's the fourth largest city in the United States. We've seen images of tens of thousands of people um, leaving their homes and finding shelter. We've seen streets turning into rivers. People still waiting to be rescued. There's no way out. What I want to point out here on this slide is that no typhoon, hurricane, or tropical storm in all of recorded history has dropped as much rain as Hurricane Harvey did in Houston. The National Weather Service had to uh, create a new scale for how much water is dropped in a particular area. This is before Harvey, and then once Harvey fully um, exerted its impact, they had to come up with a new scale because in the purple here, some areas in Houston received more than three feet of water. Houston received in this one storm more rain than they receive in a typical year. So how much water is, has fallen? So when I put this presentation together, I knew this data would be out of date. Um, but as of 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time, August 28th, if you took the Empire State Building on the left and you filled it, it's a hundred, it's a hundred stories tall. You filled it 33,000 times. That's how much water fell in Houston. Another way of looking at it is if you took all of that water at that point in time, which was nine trillion gallons, and spread it across the United States, 48 contiguous states would be covered by 0.17 inches of water, which is equivalent to three pennies. What is a hurricane? Um, one way that we look at hurricanes is that it's the Earth's heat engine. It enables the, the Earth to move uh, heat from both the sea and the air and dissipate it and redistribute it. What's interesting about hurricanes is that there are four essential ingredients to make a hurricane. They're relatively rare events, um, but when all four of these are present, you have the possibility for a perfect storm, which is what happened with Harvey. Um, two of these were exacerbated by climate change and thus made Harvey that much of a stronger storm. So you need uh, high sea surface temperature, wind, you need high air temperature and humidity, and you need thunderstorms and rainfall. And all four of those happened off the Gulf of Mexico. We know that um, the waters in the Gulf of Mexico at the time that Hurricane Harvey hit were 1.5 degrees warmer than they were recorded from 1980 to 2010. We also know that the air temperature due to climate change and the humidity was warmer. So those two elements are two of the four ingredients that create a hurricane and made the hurricane that much stronger. This is just a quick image of all of the potential impacts climate change has on California. So bringing it now back to California. And I'll speak to some of these as they relate to current events that we've been dealing with at OES. We had drought. So I'm showing you Oroville here. Um, the top is July 20th, 2011, and the bottom is January 16th, 2014. I'm showing you Oroville because we'll come back to this. Um, here, this is before the drought, and here after the drought. So we just exited six years of a historic drought. And in fact, some counties are still experiencing drought, but for the majority of the state, we've exited a pretty uh, uh, damaging drought. And by damaging, it resulted in ex a massive tree die-off. The governor declared a state of emergency for the tree mortality issue. Our last count was that we've lost approximately 102 million trees. So what you can see here is a, a house. This is before we had the massive tree die-off. And on the right, these trees are actually all dead. We have another picture where these trees are now gray because at this point they still have their needles on them. One thing to note is that um, drought also impacts the ability of trees to resist pests. So this then results in the bark beetle being able to cause additional death. So it's a compounding um, effect. 
what also does that mean? It makes us more susceptible to fires. So um, one of the interesting things that we're trying to tackle right now is that the drought and the bark beetles and climate change in general are actually changing fire behavior. So what we're seeing now is something called crown fires. These fires hop from the tops of trees. It's something we hadn't dealt with in the past, and we, um, having to respond to fires and make sure everybody's safe, need to identify how fire behavior is changing so that we can then protect um, lives and property. What I want to point out here is that um, these are images of the Valley and Butte fires in 2015. They are the two of the top 10 most destructive fires in California history, and they happened in one year. Then we went to extreme flooding. So um, on the left here, this is Oroville. This is when you know the, the reservoir filled back up and the spillway was damaged, and we were worried about the emergency spillway. It's an earthen spillway, and we didn't know what was going to happen, so we evacuated 200,000 people to protect them. It was an all-hands-on-deck effort at our agency to make sure that everyone was safe and, and evacuated. On the right um, is a town called Maxwell, California, showing uh, the flooding that occurred there. So we went from extreme drought and fires to extreme flooding. Um, 51 out of 58 counties in the state of California declared a state of emergency one, two, or three times for the flooding that happened in January and February. What most people don't know is we had three federal disaster declarations for all the flooding that occurred. It's the largest set of disasters we've had since Northridge. It's certainly not on the same scale as Northridge, but it's extensive. It covers the entire state, and we had significant damage to infrastructure. So what are we doing to prepare um, to respond to these continued extreme events? Um, what we're working on right now is updating uh, a document called Safeguarding California. And we're working with all of our state agency partners to uh, identify um, the risks that we're facing due to climate and how we're going to respond. So obviously we're in charge of the emergency management chapter and I'll walk you through that. Um, but there's a chapter on agriculture, agriculture, biodiversity and habitat, energy, forestry, oceans, public health, transportation, and water. Specifically in the emergency management chapter, we're focused on identifying research and tools that enables us to be prepared at all phases of emergency management, whether that's planning, response, and recovery. Um, we're using advisory bodies to address climate impacts that inform, inform emergency management policy. So, when I spoke about the fire behavior changing, we've created a task force that brings all of the relevant entities together so that we can discuss how fire behavior is changing and how we need to respond. We're incorporating climate change into all of our planning efforts. So climate is a, is a force multiplier, and what I mean by that is we, we plan for catastrophic events, but if we incorporate climate into, into that, we're much more prepared for large-scale flooding events. Um, we're prepared for, for other uh, large catastrophic events. Another thing I want to point out is that we're really focused on ensuring that access and functional needs communities are incorporated into everything that we do. So by this I mean uh, during Katrina we learned that there were a lot of um, communities that were disproportionately affected by the flooding that happened. So people that needed to evacuate didn't have cars to evacuate. And by our definition, those are access and functional needs communities. There are other people that are, you know, rely on dialysis machines. And we recognize we needed to plan for that so that if there is massive flooding or, or some sort of power infrastructure, that these people have access to the medicine, the dialysis, uh, that sort of need. So we're making sure that we're addressing that in everything that we do and making sure that those communities are, are thought of before the event happens. When we started rewriting our chapter, um, we, we reconvened. I worked with our policy group, who Millie works with, to convene a large group so that our entire agency um, was aware of what we needed to do so that climate is incorporated into everything that we do, all sectors within our agency, finance, admin, logistics, planning, response. And in line with that, um, we have the Governor's Executive Order B3015, which states that all state agencies shall incorporate climate into everything that they do to include planning and investment strategies. 
So with a combination of that, we decided in, in their internal working group to work with each of our directorates to meet with them and talk about how they can incorporate climate into everything that we do. Our first stop was recovery. So within recovery, we have mitigation. And mitigation for emergency management is defined as any action that we can take to reduce future risk to natural hazards. Uh, if you're talking to somebody who works in uh, climate change on a traditional basis, uh, mitigation actually means reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But for us, it means reducing risk. Specifically, we talked to Recovery about the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. And I'm going to speak to this now because it's relevant um, in, li in lieu of the fact that we had these federal disaster declarations. So the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, we get um, a percentage of the total cost of a disaster or disasters that is in excess of what the total cost was to spend on hazard mitigation grants. So um, we're looking at uh, a percentage of the total cost of the three disasters we had this, this winter to then make California more resilient to reducing um, risk. And when we met with recovery before we had the disaster declarations, we said, how about incorporating climate into a priority of things, of grants that you will fund? We can set the priorities at OES, and they agree. Um, it supports the executive order and our actions and safeguarding, and ultimately it builds resiliency in California to future climate events. These are some examples of previous projects that have been funded under this program. So on the left here, we have Napa, downtown Napa, California. Um, in previous years, uh, before they received this funding, the downtown used to experience flooding quite frequently when they had severe storms. And they applied to, uh, for a grant so that they could increase the amount of water that would go under the bridge, thus preventing flooding from occurring in the downtown area. On the bottom here, this house has created a de defensible space, which means that the next time a wildfire comes through, this house has a much higher percentage of, of not being burned. On the right here is another example of flood mitigation. So this home has been elevated by one story because it was being flooded. And this bottom floor is no longer a residential space, it's a garage. I mentioned we got, or we're anticipating get, getting quite a bit of money for hazard mitigation. Um, and we're looking at utilizing this funding um, creatively. And what we're scoping out right now is trying to identify if we can um, scope out a large-scale multi-jurisdictional project that creates, or, uh, that creates resilience to drought. And what we're doing is proposing to create a groundwater recharge project. So what that means is we're going to put water back into the underground aquifers. And so the image I'm showing you here is a map of California and an overlay from NASA showing the subsidence in the Central Valley. So subsidence, as I'm sure most of you know, is where the land is sinking. And in this area in particular, it's due to excessive groundwater being removed. And then the land sink, uh, sinks down. Um, and so what we're looking at is, is trying to identify if we can restore that, um, that subsidence, which is unlikely, but we can definitely prevent future subsidence. So this is a closer, a close up image of that. Um, the, the red here is the area of subsidence in the Central Valley. This is Fresno right here. Uh, the blue are the aquifer, or sorry, aqueducts and canals that are used to transport water throughout the state. And what is concerning to us, or an opportunity actually for us to spend our hazard mitigation grant program funding is to identify areas where this infrastructure is disrupted by the subsidence. So we can get water back in to prevent future subsidence because when these canals are affected by subsidence, their ability to transfer water from one place to another is significantly impacted and we want to prevent that. We are convening a scoping meeting um, in the middle of September. Um, it's with our, our state and federal partners and our goal is to identify a set like three to five projects where we can really have a, an impact on the community um, to prevent future subsidence, if not restore the subsidence that has already happened, and enable us to move water throughout the state, but also enable the community that is surrounding the project to have 
ultimately resilience to future drought because it will be water that, that the locals um, will be utilizing. I'm going to turn it over to Millie now, who's going to speak about um, what you can look at at the local level, um, what you can use to think about um, what the future is going to look like for you if, if we don't do anything about climate. So I'm going to turn it over.